ordained uh, clergy, and uh, some are elders and some are deacons. And on our staff, uh, we have Kathy and Phil who are ordained elders, and Calissa and I are ordained deacons. And then we have Garrett who is moving toward elders' orders uh, and is currently serving as a local pastor. So there's many ways people are a part of ministry. And for those who are in ministry and serve beyond the local church, uh, as Lindsay does, uh, they relate to a United Methodist Church for their home church and to be under the umbrella uh, of the church. And so for that reason, Lindsay has chosen to uh, affiliate uh, as a deacon with our, denom our church here. And you have seen her serve in many ways, especially with communion and, and other opportunities. But uh, Lindsay, in addition to being uh, a deacon uh, and serving for the church, she just finished a, a, a tour uh, as a part of our conference staff, is now serving as the chaplain at Columbia Theological Seminary uh, in Decatur. And in addition to that, uh, she has her own uh, counseling practice in which she uh, is, is working to help with the, the health and wellness of, of folks who are in the community and working with clergy and their families too. And so we, uh, this Sunday, we'll have the opportunity to hear Lindsay uh, as the preacher of the day for our worship services for this Laity Sunday and our focus on, on health and wellness. And so we thought it would be a wonderful opportunity for her to have a chance to, to come and present with us and to have an opportunity for us to learn and understand uh, the values of uh, support in health and wellness areas. So at this time, we'd like to, to welcome Lindsay as our speaker this morning. Good morning, everybody. I am excited to be here. I have uh, been worshiping at Dunwoody for the last I guess it's been like two and a half years or so. Um, and often get to see a number of y'all on Sunday mornings in and out. Um, but many of y'all have probably not seen me in some of my work capacity. Um, and some of the things that I get to do like conversations uh, such as this. Um, I work with lots of churches to talk about mental health and the intersection of faith and mental health and why we need to be having more of these conversations regularly among us all. Uh, so much of mental health is uh, has been stigmatized for years, and one of the key ways to reduce the stigma is for us to take it out of the shadows and out of the secret places and have these conversations with one another and be able to say to each other, uh, that we might not have it all together every moment of the day. I know that uh, we live in a society, in a world, and also churches as a whole are places where um, we should be able to go uh, and say that we might not know everything, or we might have messed up, or we might be having a really hard day, or week, or months. But it's also a place where we sometimes uh, try to hold it together even more and try to put a smile on our face and uh, kind of say, oh, with my faith, we've, we've got it. it. It's good. And um, you might even hear people say, you know, how are you? And you say, I'm blessed. I, I am blessed. And, and that may be true. And it might be a really hard day. So the scripture reading this morning uh, that we're going to focus on on Sunday uh, is 1 Kings 19. Now, I saw a few faces that were like, what? That's the one you picked? Yeah, I know. I know. I, I get to preach once every so many years and I pick, you know, the one that no one else really wants to preach on. I got it. Nobody even told me I had to preach on this. I chose it myself. That might tell you a lot about me. Uh, so let's start at the beginning. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. 
So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely. If by this time tomorrow, I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, some translations say a broom tree, sat under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush or the tree and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. And strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu son of Numishi, king over Israel and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from abel Mehola to succeed you as prophet. Okay. The word of God for the people of God. Okay. Thanks be to God. I know, it, it came at perfect timing. This text is one... Uh, that as you heard it, uh, is probably not one that a lot of people would have picked or they would have picked the end point to talk about, about where to listen for God. I really love this text because it's a text where not everything is great and rosy and comfortable and happy. It starts off that Elijah has uh, helped kill a number of people. And then he is threatened and he panics. He himself has, as a prophet, he has done great things in his life. And so on paper, everything should look great, right? His life should look good to everyone else. He should be happy based on all the things that he has going for him. And instead, he is in a dark place. He runs away from everybody. 
He goes through the desert. He starts abandoning everybody that is close to him, even his servant along the way. And then he goes and sits under a broom tree. And what does he do when he's there? He starts crying out, God, I would just rather die. If that is not the quintessential part of depression, I don't know what is. Now, he has a lot of the symptoms of depression. He is withdrawing from everybody around him. He is totally hopeless. It is clear that his sleeping habits and his eating habits have changed. Because you then have the angel going, okay, come on. You need to eat something. That's one of many symptoms that his mental health is not in a healthy, good place. Again, what I love about this scripture is that I think sometimes we come to the Bible assuming that everybody that has a strong faith Uh, That will miraculously uh, make you in uh, good mental health. You might have even heard cliches in the church before of like, if you just pray more, you will be happier. Or if you just trust the Lord more, you will not be anxious. And here we have a story of one of the most faithful prophets That is in a very dark place. That is why I like the scripture, because it makes us feel a little less alone if we are one of those people. Now, uh, let's talk about the difference between mental health and mental illness. We use this these words interchangeably a lot. And I think that uh, it's helpful to define the difference. Mental health is a person's emotional, psychological, and social well-being. Your mental health helps determine how you handle stress, relate to others, make decisions, and perceive the world. We all have mental health. Think of mental health like a spectrum. Your mental health can be flourishing some days, or I love the opposite word, languishing other days. So you can be somewhere on the spectrum. We often talk about this uh, spectrum of mental health in a binary way, that you're either like good or bad, healthy or not, when in reality, we're all kind of moving somewhere back and forth on this spectrum. Now, mental illness is the health condition that disrupts a person's thinking, feeling, mood, ability to relate to others, and daily functioning. We're going to talk about this more Sunday. Mental illness is when your mental health symptoms have gotten to a place that it starts interrupting regularly your daily functioning. And that's when we especially need to be having these conversations. But not just if you have been diagnosed with a mental illness, uh, but we should all be talking about mental health because we should all want to be mentally healthier along the way. So I want to ask this question. How are you? Okay, no, like I really want to ask the question. (laughs) How are you? Often we say things like good or fine. Um, When's the last time you actually paused uh, when you said, how are you? With somebody else and really thought how you were or really stopped to listen to what the other person had to say. We use the question, how are you, as a filler phrase now. 
um, as kind of our version of hello. You walk back down the hall and you're like, hey, how are you? And if you notice when you say that, hey, how are you? The other person usually is like, good, fine, something like that. And you never stop. It is literally, hey, how are you, as you're walking. So the question is, like, do we really want to know how other people are? Or do we really want to know how we are? And that might be, it, it might be something that could be challenging for you. And part of what's hard about answering the question is maybe you are somebody that has not uh, learned some of the ways to answer that question. Um, when we are young, I don't know how many of y'all uh, still have young kids or once had young kids, that you know how much you work on feelings together, right? So do you remember either those flashcards of all the different faces and you had to figure out what they were or the poster in your classroom or your kid's classroom of all of the cartoon faces or the real faces that you're like, oh, this person's surprised, this person's scared, all those things. Well, then we become adults and it's like we forget all of that. We spend all this time and energy with kids trying to tell them that there's a variety of feelings. And then we get to adults and we remember three, glad, mad, and sad. That's all that's left. So then when we ask how people are, that's kind of the category that might fall in if you pause long enough to ask somebody and listen to their answer. Well, there's a lot more feelings than glad, mad, or sad. And it can get really nuanced of the things that you are feeling. Um, when you are sad, there's a difference between being disappointed or feeling hurt or betrayed or feeling lonely. But we probably call all of those sad. And so there is a tool out there that uh, I can't be, I feel like I can't be a good therapist and not introduce this tool everywhere that I go. There's a tool out there called a feelings wheel which I know notoriously bringing a feelings wheel to a group of men, there are probably a few of you internally rolling your eyes going, okay, um, we're now gonna sit around and talk about our feelings. Okay, yes, I hear you. Um, and, and I know it's hard to read up close. I have a personal copy for every one of you. I know, it's such a gift. You little did you know that you would come here today and get a gift like that. This was designed by uh, Dr. Gloria Wilcox years ago. Um, and it really breaks, uh, breaks down all of these major categories. So that when you say something like, oh, I feel sad, then you have a whole bunch of options underneath it. Why I think that a feelings wheel is powerful and um, you know, Elijah probably could have benefited from a feelings wheel. Uh, is to name what's really happening. There is power in naming things. It is amazing how much healing can happen simply when we are able to identify what is really going on with us. It is hard to move forward if we don't say things like, oh, I felt really betrayed or, oh, I felt really disappointed in that moment. Again, there is power in naming all of these feelings. Um, this is a great conversation starter uh, at the dinner table, uh, in your own personal life and prayer life. If you, I tell people that I work with all the time, if you notice that someday you're feeling off, and we know those days that we don't feel like ourselves, right? And, and we can't quite identify, why am I not feeling like myself? A tool like this is great to pull out and start reading through some of the feelings and say, which one of those feels like it fits for me? 
Now, uh, Elijah uh, uses a few coping skills. I mean, again, he probably could have used a feelings wheel instead of just yelling out, God, I want to die. Um, God probably was like, tell me more. Uh, what's going on? Are you afraid? Fearful? Are you feeling lonely? Are you, maybe you're feeling disappointed. You were riding high and now everybody is uh, real upset with you and you are no longer riding high anymore. And so you can engage in all sorts of coping skills along the way. The first one that he uses that is super unhealthy, he just runs away and withdraws. That is a coping skill probably a lot of us have used before. When things are really hard, one of the easiest tools to engage, not the healthiest, but easiest, is to withdraw from everybody. Try to disconnect. Maybe if nobody sees me like this, it'll feel safer or more comfortable. That is a natural coping skill we may go to because it feels like a quick fix. Long term, it is not the healthiest coping skill because we are created to be in community with one another. At, if we go back to Genesis, when God created people at the very beginning, God created one person and then said, it is not good for them to be alone. Now, a lot of times that scripture is read in context of marriage. And I think deeper than that, that scripture should be read in context of community. It is not good for a person to be alone. Therefore, a second person is created. That is what's happening this morning when y'all gather together, that you are created to be in community and relationship with one another. And this community is one where maybe it is natural. Uh, you start feeling that itch when you feel not like yourself. Uh, and you start leaning on that coping skill, maybe I'll just withdraw and run away. And hopefully this community and the people around your table or the people that you know well or might not know well yet can reach out to you and notice when you're withdrawing. Maybe even pull out a feelings wheel and say, hey, buddy, how's it going? What's What are you feeling? I mean, that might be go going too far. Just noticing somebody's withdrawing might be a good first step. But we're created to be in community with one another. It may feel safer to engage a tool like withdrawing and being alone. But in the long run, that is not what God wants for us. The other things that Elijah does, Elijah uh, doesn't stop talking to God. Even in the darkest moments. Elijah may cry out and say, God, I'd rather just die. But Elijah doesn't stop talking to God. God doesn't need us to uh, have these happy, peppy conversations all the time. It is okay to talk to God and be like, life is really terrible right now. This sucks. This is nothing that I envisioned. God can handle it. Because of stories like this, we have examples that God sits with us. In my counseling practice, I say, uh, you sit in the suck. You sit in the bad stuff. And God will sit with us in those moments, not just the mountaintop moments only. God is there. We're going to, on Sunday, talk about a few other coping skills. Again, ones that I wish that Elijah uh, might have engaged. Uh, I mean, I kind of wish that he'd talk to a therapist instead of just running away or yelling out to God or, you know, hiding under a broom tree. Uh, 
talking to a therapist is uh, a lot easier than a lot of people think. It can feel uh, sound intimidating. And for years, uh, especially for men, society has taught us to kind of like hold it all in, right? You, you just be strong, be stoic. Has anybody ever seen those stress ball, stress, uh, little creatures where if you squeeze them, like an arm pops out or eyes pop out or a leg pops out. Okay. I've seen a few people nodding, so I'm not the only one with these things. Okay, that's what happens in our lives when we don't care for ourselves and find outlets and coping skills for these things to come out. They are going to come out in the strangest ways. You are going to yell at somebody you love. You are going to make a desperate choice. Something something like that. You're going to withdraw from other people. The stressors are going to continue to exist. And you can choose how to create a healthy outlet, like, like talking to a therapist. Or you can let it be a surprise and it can pop out like those stress creatures and it come out a random way. I also wish that Elijah um, had maybe had access to some medication. We probably don't talk about that often enough. That medication isn't a magical answer. And at the same time, if it's really hard to engage some of these other coping skills, then maybe we need a little uh, step out of the hole. I describe it as, especially if you're experiencing depression or maybe anxiety, if you feel like you're in a pit and you the pit is real deep and you keep jumping and can't reach the rope to get out when the rope might be a coping skill to help you get out. Then maybe medication is a, a little box to stand on to reach the coping skill. Maybe it takes the edge off or gives you a little extra energy to engage that. There is absolutely no shame in engaging in some medication. We don't seem to think twice about taking medication for lots of other physical illnesses, right? And our mental health and depression and anxiety uh, can be very similar. Now, I want uh, us to have time to talk with one another around the tables about some of this topic. Maybe this topic is one that you have talked about with uh, friends before, and maybe this is a very first time that you have talked about it. So I have some questions uh, for y'all to discuss at the tables. And also if, if one of the things that would be helpful is just talking about what it's like to have these conversations, you can start there too. The first question, and I'm gonna pass out to you, like I said, your very own feelings wheel. You get to take one home. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you ask each other, how are you doing? Uh, you can try using the feelings wheel and see what you find. You might just learn something about yourself or having a tool or more language around it. The second question I want you to think about at your table is what makes it hard to tell other people or admit to yourself how you really feel? The third one, what coping skills have you used before to help you on days and weeks when your mental health isn't flourishing? Or what coping skills do you think you might want to try? Let's take some time at our tables to talk about this.